Welcome everyone. I'm Dave Isley from the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery. I are very pleased to welcome you to the Michael E. Johns lecture on healthcare policy. Dr. Johns unfortunately could not be here today, but he is honored with this lectureship and has served as the director of the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery from 1984 until 1990. During his tenure as director, he expanded our department and fostered interdepartmental research efforts and collaborations uh, with biomedical engineering and neuroscience to create the Center for Hearing Sciences, which is the catalyst for world-renowned hearing research. He propelled our department to become the premier academic department in the country and the top research-funded department in the United States. In the final four years of his directorship, he also served as Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs before being appointed Dean of the Medical Faculty. He led the design and co construction of the Johns Hopkins Outpatient Center, which is next door. And as Dean, he elevated the School of Medicine into first place in sponsored research, reformed the curriculum, and developed innovative technology transfer programs. In 1996, he moved to Emory University where he served in multiple roles. He served as Dean of the Medical School, Executive Vice President of the Health Science Center, and Chancellor for the University. Presently, Dr. Johns is a professor of, in the School of Medicine and Public uh, Health, and is Executive Vice President for Health Affairs, President, CEO, and Chair Emeritus of Emory Healthcare. We welcome all of you to this lectureship today, and at this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Paul Rothman, Dean of the School of Medicine and also CEO of Johns Hopkins Medicine. Thank you. Thank you, David. Good afternoon. It's great to be together, even if we're masked here in this room, but it's good at least that we were able to get together after a couple years and celebrate um, our alumni today. But it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Although he's not here in person, I'm pleased to, to um, introduce you to Senator Roy Blunt and introduce him to Johns Hopkins. Senator Blunt's a consummate public servant, having held elected office for most of the last five decades, including leadership positions in the House and Senate. Known for his ability to work across party lines, he's championed critical investments in biomedical research, community mental health, and higher education. He began his political career as a county clerk and rose to be Missouri's Secretary of State before being elected to Congress. First in his generation to graduate college, he went on to become president of his alma mater. Today, Senator Blunt is on the Intelligence Committee, Rules Committee, and as a top Republican on the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee that oversees health. There is no greater friend to the biomedical research community than Senator Blunt. In ensuring seven years of sustained increases in the NIH budget, Senator Blunt gave the community its greatest gift, certainty and predictability. He's been a stalwart champion for physicians and healthcare providers nationwide. We are particularly grateful for his swift action as the lead co-sponsor on a bill that we spearheaded during the height of the pandemic to address licensure barriers for cross-state telehealth. A former aide once said, there are two kinds of politicians in Washington, those who want to make a point and those who want to make a difference. Senator Blunt worked to make a difference. Senator Blunt has been in office for some of the major moments in our nation's history, including 9-11, and the worst financial crisis in American history. Now, as he approaches retirement from the Senate, we're inviting him to reflect on the changing political landscape and its implications for research, teaching, and patient care. Join me in welcoming Senator Roy Blunt. Well, thank you, Neen Rothman. Great to be with you. I wish I could have been there uh, in person, but here we are in the uh, third year of COVID. Uh, and my wife, Abby, and I both tested Monday positive uh, for COVID for the first time. We were right at the first ranks of people who had every possible uh, vaccine you could have. And, um, of course, uh, that story is one that I think one of the stories wasn't ever properly told. Uh, the vaccine we knew from the very first wouldn't keep 100% of the people that had it from getting COVID. 
What we didn't know was the great likelihood that of the two out of 10 or whatever that number might have been that would get COVID, uh, that if they'd had the vaccine, they wouldn't have very serious uh, implications from that COVID. And uh, that's where I am, but I still have to be quarantined. I was really looking forward uh, to being there with all of you in person. I've done a lot of uh, Zoom talks and Zoom meetings as probably everybody in this room or everybody listening uh, has done, but there is still something different when you can see the crowd and uh, get a sense of, of connectedness and other things that are important. But as an alternative, not to be there at all today, this was a, a, a great alternative for me. And thanks to you and your team for uh, making it possible to be there uh, in, in this way. Uh, as you pointed out, uh, Dr. Rothman, we have worked really hard uh, in our office uh, in looking at health research. Certainly, Johns Hopkins is right at the pinnacle of the health research institutions in the country, always right at the top of the list of, of a great variety of, of health research opportunities. And as you pointed out, the situation we were in when I became the chairman of this uh, big subcommittee, and it's after the, if you take defense off the table, uh, the appropriating committee of labor and health and human services and education has about a third of all the money that's left for the other 11 committees. So it's, uh, it's a committee that has lots of jurisdiction, but in the critically important uh, part of that jurisdiction of health research, there really hadn't been any increase in over a decade uh, and one of the things in a bipartisan way uh, we were able to get done after I became chairman, uh, Tom Cole was the chairman in the House Committee, uh, Rosa DeLora, the ranking uh, member, now the, now the chairman of, of the subcommittee, and uh, Patty Murray, the, the lead Democrat on our side, and now the chairman of the subcommittee. The four of us have worked hard over the last seven years to increase that funding by over 50%. Uh, seven years ago, the research community felt like with the cost of research, that really the research dollars that you had that were the same dollars you had 10 years ago were had lost about 22% of their buying power. So obviously getting back to just where we were took almost half of that 50%. And, and we feel like that uh, not only have we in seven straight years of significant increases uh, made, a, made a difference in research, but also hopefully restored the important commitment that the federal government needs to have uh, to research. So we're moving forward there. And you know what a critical time for research. Uh, when I started chairing the committee um, eight, almost eight years ago now, we're in our, into our eighth budget cycle, almost eight years ago now, uh, Senator Toomey from uh, Pennsylvania said, you know, there's some project at the University of, of uh, Pennsylvania at Philadelphia, a, a health research project. I, I'm not exactly sure I can tell you much detail, but I'm, I'm convinced you and I should go look at it. And we did. And uh, it was, uh, it was uh, Dr. Carl June had about 70 people in a leukemia-based uh, immunotherapy a project again only eight years ago and of course two or three years after that uh, immunotherapy became one of the go-to uh, things to look at for uh, cancer uh, particularly the health cancers uh, you're talking about uh, personalized medicine in ways we never thought of uh, until the last decade CRISPR technology other things what a critical time uh, to be absolutely committed to health research uh, but also critically important that we have the kind of commitment that allowed young researchers who a decade ago really weren't getting many research opportunities to have enough of those opportunities to stay in the field. Dr. Collins, who has run NIH during almost the entire period we're talking about, uh, was um, very uh, thoughtful in trying to work with us to be sure that some of that money uh, went in a significant way to young researchers, I think that's happened. And you know, healthcare generally, these are huge issues that have incredible amounts of federal commitment now, and issues really that the Congress doesn't have the level of expertise uh, that you need to have to deal with these issues without the kind of outside advice that uh, 
our research co community gives us, that the people we work for that are involved in healthcare give us. And then of course you go beyond that to the incredible challenges of the last couple of years. So the challenges to healthcare providers, the challenges to healthcare researchers, uh, the opportunity to find significant new ways to move forward with uh, uh, vaccines through uh, RNMA, the, the, the difference in the way we do things is pretty dramatic. And I think healthcare is only gonna change in a much more dramatic way. I'm convinced that uh, in the very near future, your healthcare provider is more likely to call the average American than the average American is to call them because of some patch or some uh, some uh, device on your, your phone or something that creates a sense that, well, maybe it's time to check in and see uh, the one thing we watching carefully on this patient doesn't seem, or this, the, this uh, person who we provide health care for doesn't seem to be doing what it should be. So uh, what an incredible time to be there. And then the, the, the COVID challenges to data, uh, to public health generally, I think all of our institutions in health uh, suffered some significant challenges. I think the actual on hands-on um, providers probably came through this with the most appreciation. Uh, the others trying to deal with a rapidly moving uh, target and uh, you know, CDC, uh, NIH, the public health system generally are all systems that uh, I think are in a significant place to have a, a new look at them. Let me make two quick comments about just uh, government ge uh, generally and particularly the Congress in the last 25 years. This is the my 26th year in the Congress. Um, as uh, the Dean pointed out, I was a county official. I was the first Republican elected Secretary of State of Missouri in 52 years when I won that statewide job had a chance to be the majority whip in the House and one of the elected leaders in the Senate from the first year I was there, elected by the other senators to the handful of, of leadership jobs uh, in, in the Senate uh, and had a chance to do that. I think 25 years ago, there was still a much more fundamentally basic um, regular order biz way to get the business done of the Congress. and. You know, we've one slipped into a place where everything too often winds up in one big piece of legislation at the end of, of the process. And also politically about a dozen years ago, it began to be more and more common for people to say, uh, if uh, I get elected, here's what I'm gonna be for. And if I can't get this, I won't be for anything else. Sort of a, a antithetical, uh, line drawn that doesn't work in a real democracy uh, where people have to work together, come together. Uh, don't Seldom do you find something that is a perfect bill, uh, but to find something that you can do that moves forward. And I would say that we found that spot in the five big bipartisan bills in 2000, uh, 2020. Um, obviously the healthcare community certainly the congressional community were guessing as to what we would do with a pandemic like we were facing. There was no, 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 no experience with anything like this. Nobody had gone through uh, the influenza crisis of, uh, of 1918 and trying to figure out how do you uh, underpin the economy, try to move forward with healthcare and try to create new and quicker ways to do the things that you would uh, normally be doing. Uh, and uh, I, I think those five bills should give people some hope that when the Congress is absolutely uh, stressed to a point that ha things have to be done, we can still get things done. And the way to measure government is not always uh, how much you get done as opposed to how well you're doing, what people expect the government to do. Uh, but glad to be with you today. I, I think um, most of this time was to be set aside for uh, more of a conversation. And I'm certainly delighted to talk about uh, anything you want to or listen to any advice that you think somebody like me might need. 
Well, Senator, I'm, I'm not sure that I'd like to give you any advice, um, but um, I do appreciate your 25 years in the Congress and what you've done. So I have a series of questions that I'm gonna start off with. Um, first, you know, we've seen mistrust in science and public health grow in a negative direction over the past few years. In your opinion, what can we do as medical practitioners and as community members to engage the public and get back on track? You know, I think, uh, Dr. Rothman, one of, the, one of the challenges of the last year is that there was uh, so little certainty to deal with. Uh, and uh, medical practitioners um, like to deal with certainty with the patients that they're talking to, the people that have uh, turned their, their health care life over uh, to that, that doctor, that health care provider. Uh, and you know the, the famous if you want an, if you want a second opinion, find another doctor uh, may be something that just doesn't work in this kind of environment where there's so much information out there and it is is uh, is quickly changing. Uh, one, I, I'd be I think I'd be pretty nuanced in my discussions if you thought that uh, your your patient was ready for that level of nuance. And two, I'd be more frank about not knowing exactly where we are at a given point on something that uh, like what we, we just faced. I do think there was some lack of, there's a lack of confidence in the system, uh, even though the system performed in so many admirable ways during the last two years. Again, I, let me repeat, the, uh, the uh, vaccine that uh, was available in nine months as opposed to three years, which would have been a record uh, the uh, Senator Alexander, Lamar Alexander, who I should mention, along with Senator Durbin, great advocates of more healthcare research. Uh, Senator Alexander was chairing the authorizing committee. I was chairing the appropriating committee. We came together and came up with uh, an idea. Of, we called it the Shark Tank to have different people with when testing was in such a shortage to come to NIH. NIH had a couple of billion dollars. Uh, they invested directly with, uh, I think, eventually about 30 different companies. All of the home tests are provided now through that Shark Tank process. Uh, but um, I, I believe we need to be real realistic about, uh, you know, CDC had different views, failed early on to produce a test that worked didn't seem to be all that concerned about the fact that they couldn't produce a test that worked. Uh, my good friend, Dr. Fauci at uh, NIH was constantly out there uh, trying to give advice uh, in an uncertain environment. Did you need a mask or not need a mask? Remember, we all thought that uh, when everybody that was uh, talking about this thought that COVID was, uh, was, was, was transmitted on surfaces. Um, people were wearing gloves to the grocery store, including me, wiping canned goods off when they got them home. There was a moment when everybody was told for a few days that, well, on, on stainless steel, the uh, COVID uh, virus might last for weeks before it went away if, if something didn't happen to eliminate that virus. It turned out to be airborne. Uh, in, in a way that people hadn't anticipated. Uh, the data system uh, for uh, NIH, uh, for CDC rather, really outdated. I don't think that's the fault of CDC, but it would be the fault of CDC if we don't figure out how to do something about it. And I talked to uh, Dr. Walensky about it yesterday, who's, who clearly understands the importance of getting a data system that works better than one where uh, locals report to the state. The state reports some, if not all, of everything to the federal government. You have data, but it's more valuable uh, in some kind of historic reference than it is any kind of immediate predictive uh, use. So we've got to we've got to do a better job, I think, of of being sure that the uh, that the healthcare infrastructure and superstructure uh, realizes the lessons we need to learn from 
what we hope is a really unique experience that we just went through the last two years. And since I'm at home with COVID, since we're still going through to, to some extent. Well, thank you, Senator. I will take a little pride here at Hopkins that one of our associate professors and her students over one weekend could develop a dashboard that was a trusted source early on. So I can't imagine that with all the resources that you'll have down there that we can't get a better robust reporting system for diseases so that the country can move forward. I'm gonna change the topic a little bit, uh, just uh, something that you know I'm passionate about. Um, you and Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut were the two leading champions in the Senate for the TREAT Act, which would remove licensure barriers to telehealth during a public health emergency. Essentially, if you're licensed in one state, you'd be able to treat patients in any state like a driver's license. What are the bill's chances of passage this session and if it takes more than just one session, as it often does, who would be a worthy successor from you to take over the mantle? Well, I do think that this is a critically important addition to the healthcare system. Uh, it's uh, one of the things that uh, COVID forced us to do something we probably should have done at the federal level uh, five or six years ago, which is telehealth generally. There are really two topics here. Let me quickly talk about. One is telehealth generally. Uh, the, the, the CMS, the group that uh, determines how federal health care dollars are going to be allocated through Medicare and Medicaid primarily, uh, long held the view that if people could go to the, it was easier to go to the doctor, more people would go to the doctor, and uh, it would cost more money. And so Medicare and Medicaid would be, would, would be uh, disadvantaged by people going to the doctor more frequently. Uh, the real facts, I think, would indicate if you go to the doctor more frequently, you don't go to the emergency room or the ICU nearly as frequently, and you probably save money. So one, telehealth generally is something we ought to figure out how to factor into the system in a more permanent way. Uh, and uh, two, uh, telehealth, particularly uh, in uh, the, the pandemic, uh, when people were incredibly reluctant to go where other people were who weren't well uh, became uh, essentially important. Uh, and the second topic, the one that uh, uh, Chris Murphy and I have worked so hard on uh, is the licensure issue uh, where uh, in, in states like Missouri, where we have a big health healthcare centers on the borders of our state in Kansas City and St. Louis and Springfield, Joplin, uh, Cape Girardeau, St. Joseph, uh, all of our health, virtually all of our healthcare centers have people come to them every day from other states. And that's perfectly fine because you come to Missouri to see a Missouri licensed healthcare provider, you get your healthcare, you drive back to where you live. Uh, but what happens when you need your healthcare where you live and your provider uh, is somewhere else? And uh, it's an issue that we need to figure out. We need to figure it out in my view more permanently than just in a short-term pandemic environment. And we also need to figure it out for mental health, uh, behavioral health. One of the issues I've worked a lot on with Senator Stabenow from, uh, from Michigan. Uh, we've got a major pilot in behavioral health we may be able to talk about later, but behavioral health is particularly um, a well-suited for uh, for telehealth, often your behavioral health provider is even further away than your other health provider. And if you can connect with that telehealth provider uh, in a tele, uh, that behavioral health provider through telehealth, it's, it's better to do that. Uh, colleges are a great example. Universities a great example. We saw so many people at school in the unusual environment in the last two years have behavioral health, mental health challenges they wouldn't normally have had. And if you've got a good uh, behavioral health uh, person where you live that you're already working with, that's probably the best person to work with. If you found a good behavioral health person on your campus as a student, and suddenly you're working virtually from, uh, from a different place, a different state, uh, the on-campus person that you've developed that relationship may be the best person to continue to work with. 
Uh, and so I, I think this is a really important uh, addition to the system. It's one we need to maintain. There's an active discussion, uh, Dean Rothman, right now going on about uh, the mental health components uh, to the, uh, the violence issues that we're trying to deal with, the, 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 the killings that we're talking about right now. Uh, and telehealth needs to be part of whatever kind of mental health component you have there, and it, it probably, we also need to figure out where we're doing that, uh, what the licensure structure is. Is it just like a driver's license? If you get a driver's license in one state, is it good in every other state? Uh, do you have to have a person in-person contact before that triggers the telehealth uh, capacity? Uh, but it's uh, something that, uh, we do need to figure out, and I think uh, there's a great deal of interest in this, even more than there was uh, five or six weeks ago. I've been in several telehealth discussions over the last three or four days with other senators from both parties. I think this is going to be a critically important uh, thing that we move forward with, and uh, I hope we have this done by the end of the year in a way that, uh, at least for the initial legislation, we don't have to find another partner for Chris Murphy, but we find lots of uh, other people who are going to be uh, working hard to defend a system that really adds a lot to health care generally. Well, thank you, Senator, and thank you for your advocacy, because I agree with you. Telehealth and trying to overcome these barriers is important. But you raised a good point about mental health, and I have a great quote from you which says, for too long, ERs have been the de facto mental health system in the country. This that is wrong and must be fixed. As you stated, you know, these mental health is, I think most physicians will agree, one of the areas of medicine that has been less in, least invested in, and especially by government. So tell me a little bit, Senator, what you think is going to happen at the federal level to help our mental health system. Well, I, I think we're, we've made great progress just in the last few years on this. I mentioned earlier, Senator Stabenow and I have worked together on this. I've worked with others on this as well, but she and I in 2013 uh, came up with an idea called an excellence in mental health to where uh, people, uh, states that had the right level of providers, the right level of trained providers, uh, facilities that had 24 seven access could become part of a federally encouraged program uh, to where you treat mental health just like all other health, basically on the federally qualified health center model, where you treat everybody as they come in. If they have a government program, you treat them with that government program. Uh, if uh, they have a personal insurance that's covered, you treat them with that. Uh, if they don't have, there's a very affordable sliding scale. And then, then at the end of the year, there's a moment where the federally qualified health center and the state government with federal assistance uh, essentially true up to where no money was lost in treating every patient that came in the door when they came in the door. Uh, we have 10 states now that are fully into that, into that program. Uh, we have uh, 31 other states that have one or more significant units uh, in the program that met the criteria that went through HHS that got the approval uh, and uh, the really good news is we've had the first state, Minnesota, has applied to make this part of their regular Medicaid program, even though the reimbursement would be slightly less than it is in the pilot um, from the federal government. Uh, I think what they figured out and what I thought would be the case, uh, and Senator Stabenow and I have been persuaded of this, so we're keeping track of the other healthcare costs of people that had behavioral health issues. And I think it's easily demonstrable in most of these states uh, based on the records they've kept. And Minnesota has made the decision we hope states would make to say, we're gonna do this whether the federal government is involved in this new way or not, because we save more money on the other healthcare costs of the one in five adult Americans that NIH says as a diagnosable and almost always treatable mental health problem, uh, then we spend on the mental health problem that people are dealing with. And um, because of that, uh, 
we we see, I think, a more of a willingness to talk about mental health as just another healthcare problem. So the last day of October 2013, uh, we went to the floor, Senator Stabenow and I did to talk about the last bill that President Kennedy signed into law, late October 1963, the Community Mental Health Act. And in the Community Mental Health Act, there's a lot of discussion about the facilities that need to be closed and other discussion about the kinds of facilities that need to be opened. And those large institutional facilities that needed to be closed largely were, were generally closed, but the replacement facilities never developed. And so we really have had a mental health system where the, the local, the police department, law enforcement, and the emergency room have become the de facto mental health delivery system for the country, and nobody benefits from that. People with behavioral health problems don't benefit, their families don't benefit, the emergency room certainly doesn't benefit, and, and law enforcement doesn't benefit. And one of the great advocates uh, for uh, excellence in mental health for uh, these, these uh, community, these certified community behavioral health centers are law enforcement who suddenly have uh, a partner in this process and somewhere to go and somebody that can begin to intervene in a way that's more than one night in a hospital or one night uh, in, in some other kind of facility. Uh, and uh, we, we, we have to do a better job here. And we certainly all know the mental health challenges at all levels, uh, that the displacement and the isolation of uh, the COVID environment in the last two years have created for uh, young people uh, at the very youngest age, school age kids, uh, to uh, people who had dependency issues that they had under control, but suddenly your, your support system is gone and uh, your isolation takes over. Uh, and, and we've seen so many statistics head in the wrong way in 2020, even if they'd been headed in the right way for the two or three years of engagement before that. Well, thank you, Senator. I think if that moves forward, it'd be wonderful. Senator, when you think about your legacy, what do you hope most people remember? Well, you know, I'm, I'm getting pretty close to the end of 26 years in the Congress now. And um, I, I think as I think about the kinds of things that I've wound up not only talking about, but uh, even in answering one of your questions, hey, who's going to take uh, this uh, this issue next? And who's going to take this next? I think clearly health care would be one of the things that uh, I'm, I'm most pleased to have been involved in. It's been a, a time of dramatic change, not because of me, but just dramatic change that I happen to be involved at a time when so many things are happening so quickly and health care changing so dramatically. Uh, mental health, uh, is one of the things that um, I, I think we, I've been able to be a partner in making a difference in. Uh, I've been on the Intel Committee, the, the, uh, the committee that our intelligence agencies report to and uh, talk to the 15 or so senators on that committee different than they're able to talk to the other, uh, other 80 plus senators. And uh, I think um, those national security issues of cybersecurity and other things will be also things that I'm pleased about, though they've not been able to get the level of public discussion, but certainly in, in uh, my sense have been important. But I, I do think uh, the, uh, the issues we're talking about today of, of, uh, of mental health, of uh, health care research, of uh, seeing what's happened, you know, we, we're not that far away from discovering the genomic map and then suddenly uh, now we're at a place where we're looking at what you might do to to change that genomic map for ever for an individual in specific ways you know every one of us it turns out is different than all of the rest of us uh and healthcare is going to reflect that in ways in the future that it has not been able to before and if i've been able to have any role in that at all it would be something that I'd be very, very pleased about as we move forward and look at 
of the cancer and Alzheimer's and the orphan diseases that are out there that don't get the attention uh, they would need as we move to microbial uh, studies. Um, all, uh, what, what an exciting time and uh, what an exciting time to either be in healthcare or doctor the students that you're working with every day. I just imagine what their healthcare provider life is gonna look like as opposed to what the people who are coming to the end of a career in healthcare, uh, what that career looked like at the beginning of their healthcare life. And I'm, I'm glad I've had a chance to be part of that. And let me say again, glad to have great bipartisan partners in uh, uh, the, the other three people involved in the funding, uh, Senator Burr and Senator Murray, and Senator Alexander involved on the authorizing committee, Senator Durbin, uh, good friends on the House side as well. Uh, and uh, I do feel like this is something that uh, if government can stay focused on the need to do it, that our great, unbelievable university and research community that's uniquely designed in our country to where it's not run by the government, but what a great partnership of, uh, of that community with the taxpayers of America and a, and a the rule of law and structured society where the, that partnership can really produce incredible results for the whole world. Well, thank you, Senator. I, I think you, those are great words about your legacy and, uh, and what you've done is so important. Thinking about that, you know, we have some young people on the Zoom today and what would you tell them about the importance of engaging in policymaking and government? Well, I would say, you know, one thing that I've said to people for a long time now who would have some interest in, in doing what I've done and get to be an elected policymaker, that the best way to prepare that for that is to prepare for whatever you want to do if you don't do that. Uh, that uh, in public policy, uh, there's need for people to have training. And I'm not a lawyer. I think we used to always think that lawyers were uh, were the, the, the pathway to government politics. Um, I'm a history teacher and a, uh, you know, love the history of the country and that, that's been a, a good path for me. Uh, but um, to, to plan for what you'd like, we need engineers, we need mathematicians, we need all kinds of people to make the system work. But what we don't need are people who feel like that that political job is so critically important to hold on to that you it will do anything it takes to hold on to the job as opposed to do what it takes uh, to do the job. So uh, think about what you want to do. There's plenty of room for that in public policy. And then in the non-elected public policy, I think there's great opportunity to be involved. I, I do think uh, at the public health community level, uh, it, it seemed to me as we looked at COVID that the public health level was didn't have either the attention or the respect that it had a couple of generations ago when one of the important persons in any community was the county health official or the city health commissioner uh, who people knew who they were when they said here's something to watch out for people uh, understood that that was an important thing to be part of. I think there's gonna be a lot of focus in the next decade on what do we do to, re, to, to be sure that the public health system has the vitality that it needs. Uh, and then beyond that, what do we do to be sure that uh, uh, we're, we're dealing with uh, individuals and uh, individual healthcare cases as well as research. I just think in all, in all these places, the doors are more easily open than people think they are, particularly if you're willing to give of yourself and your time, whether it's actual working in a political campaign, volunteering to be part of a, of a community group to look at some health problem in the community, uh, or looking for what you can do to, uh, to uniquely bring a research opportunity or uh, something like that to uh, to your campus. Um, I think those doors are not that hard to open, particularly if you're willing to do it and not worry about one, either the immediate credit or the immediate financial reward, but you really want to be involved in public policy. 
I think this is going to be a, a really important time for all public policy, but particularly for public policy as it relates to health. Uh, the generations of people living right now, particularly younger generation, have gone through something like nobody else alive has gone through. And what do we do to enhance uh, virtual education? What do we do to enhance uh, the, uh, the dissemination of information? How do we share data quicker in a way that it becomes more predictive and more helpful because it's more predictive? Um, all of those things out, are out there, and uh, I, I think they're ready for uh, people who know how to know how to uh, uh, use uh, the uh, ability to to structure things today uh, in new ways. Uh, and uh, you know, also, I, one of the point I'll make while we're talking here, I think healthcare is highly under-engineered. I think there are going to be a lot of health care developments uh, that, again, whether it's wearable devices or um, or actual medical devices of various kinds, I think there's going to be a lot of lot of opportunity in the healthcare engineering world as well as the healthcare uh, providing and healthcare research world. Great. No, I, I agree. So, you know, who are the leaders you admire the most? Who what? Who are the leaders that you admire the most? Well, you know, from a political sense, one, I've, I've thought about this quite a bit lately as it related to President Reagan, who was interested in creating a generational majority to govern with, as opposed to each of the two current political parties seem to be just more, seem to be really committed to being permanent minority parties, where they get deeper and deeper into the place they're already at rather than figuring out how to reach out and create a greater governing consensus that has the ability and the elasticity to get things done. Um, people I've worked with, I admire a lot. Uh, uh, Senator Mikulski, who's on your campus part of the time now, and I worked close together uh, in the uh, appropriating committee of the, her last years and my first years in the Senate, Lamar Alexander, another person, both of them would have personalities who while they had strong feelings about things, understood that you need to, you need to be able to work with other people uh, to get things done. Uh, Dr. Collins at NIH, I think uh, did a great job at NIH of taking science and make it seem both understandable and approachable and something that members of Congress were willing to buy into uh, as have uh, Others who led, uh, who led uh, NIH uh, before him, but he's the only person that led NIH under three different uh, presidents. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of people I admire. There are actually a lot of people I like. It's um, it's in my office almost uh, people my, people who worked me for a long time just smile and shake their head where I say I really like them. Uh, you know, you can find good traits in so many people if you look for them, but. Uh, people that have uh, the flexibility and capacity to work with others and get things done are the people I have the greatest admiration for. Oh, that's wonderful. It shows why you've been so effective in Washington. Um, you know, of the things you've done, Senator, obviously we talked a little bit before, but your ability to partner across the aisle and increase NIH funding for seven years in a row it's something obviously everyone here appreciates. What motivates you to focus in so much on biomedical research? You know, I when I came to the Congress, it was not the it was 1996 when I was elected to the Congress, and we were just starting that process of doubling NIH research. Uh, it happened in a relatively short period of time. Now, the number wasn't nearly as big as the number today, so it was easier to double it. Um, I think one of the recent years was the biggest year that uh, increase in NIH research ever. Uh, but that, that doubling matter, looking at what happened uh, in healthcare after the uh, the, the figuring out how the, the human genome, a process that we thought would take much longer than it took to figure out, 
uh, and seeing how quickly uh, that process has changed to where uh, for a few hundred dollars now, you can get a pretty significant genomic profile. I was at a hospital uh, in Kansas City the other day going through the hospital uh, and um, the, um, the discussion was that we'd like in the next few years for every child who's born here, if their parents want to know it whenever they leave to have a significant genetic healthcare profile to take with them. Uh, and maybe for a hundred dollars, maybe for no dollars, if the family wants it and they can't afford to get it in some other way. I think we've seen so much dramatic change so quickly uh, that um, I, I find that incredibly intriguing. Uh, but if you look back, if you look back a generation and every, so many people in this room can do this better than I can, we're in, uh, you know, the pharmaceuticals, a couple of questions not too that long ago were once you got beyond taking aspirin and are you allergic to penicillin, there wasn't much else to ask to where seeing this great uh, pharmaceutical revelation, uh, we're gonna sy synthetic biology is going to have a big impact on healthcare uh, potentially and lots of other things in the economy, uh, particularly, but I, I I do think we're gonna see this change so quickly and so dramatically that it will be hard to even at this moment, if you look back at where we were in healthcare 10 years ago or 20 years ago, I, I think even incredibly capable healthcare professionals like so many people there with you today would almost shake your hand, head and say, surely that was more than 10 years ago that this is what we were doing on this particular topic or where we thought the limits of our capacity were and were likely to be for a long time. Um, and um, I think uh, we're, we're going to see dramatic changes and uh, that those are going to come from research and whether it's ag research or health research, the one thing the federal government has played a significant role in in, in our country uh, is encouraging uh, that kind of research that allows us to uh, create better lives and better quality for those lives. Thank you. Senator, I'm going to dive a little deep on that question. So in, the, in a recent hearing on the president's FY23 NIH budget, you're quoted as saying, NIH is clearly in a period of transition. If there's one lesson to be learned from the COVID-19 pandemic, it's that our nation's success depends on medical research infrastructure across the country supported by NIH. Now is not the time to impend in that goal. Now is the time, in fact, to make it even stronger. Will you just talk about um, transitioning? So when you think about NIH in the future, what's it gonna look like and what's ARPA-H gonna look like and how do you think ARPA-H is gonna extend or change what, what the rest of NIH does? Well, I, I'm glad you brought that up and I, I, I'm thinking surely there would have been a time earlier that I could have mentioned ARPA H because I think it's such an important uh, concept that the president wants to advance. I want to be helpful uh, in that. Um, I've been of the view that ARPA H could probably best function and most quickly be established if it was associated in some way with NIH. Uh, but I certainly don't see it even in that environment as just another institute in NIH. I think ARPA-H particularly uh, benefits from what we saw happen uh, with COVID. I, I see ARPA-H as sort of more like um, the Shark Tank environment I talked about. I think that NIH, they called it RAD-X, uh, but I like the Shark Tank better because it was the idea that we said, let's get, there seem to be a lot of ideas out there of how we can move forward quickly on these tests, particularly home tests, let's let people come in with those ideas, about 700 different groups of individuals, some of them companies, some of them three guys in a, in a garage uh, came up with, and that narrowed down pretty quickly to 150 or so, and that narrowed down to a, a smaller number that stayed in the, in the shark tank for a month, and that narrowed down, I think, to eventually 30 or 40. Uh, but what ARPA-H would do, much like, you know, the defense advanced research is sort of the basic um, 
structure for all of these advanced research agencies. There's one in energy, there's one in defense. I think there's another one or two, but this would be one for health. And I think that's more where you see, again, the government in this case becoming a more permanent partner like they do in defense research, finding something that they have every reason to believe there is a important solution to if you would pursue it, putting together a group of people that aren't permanently part of anything like CDC or NIH, but a group of people that may come uh, from uh, research institutions one or two at a time. Would you be willing to leave Johns Hopkins for three years to work on this? Would you be willing to use, leave Washington University in St. Louis for three years to work on this. We're putting this group of people together to work with some selected um, company that would actually be there as the as the the company doing the the, the work and pursuing whatever we come up with, and let's find a solution. Uh, and. Um, I, I think we've seen some opportunities here in COVID that should lead us to believe that we can pursue vigorously more than we're going to have a five-year grant and we're going to check with you every couple of years and see how it's going. This would be more like we're going to have a very specific target. We're going to be a partner in that target and we're going to determine if we can get there and if we see at some point we can't get there say, well, that didn't work out as well as we thought it would have. But I think more often than not, if you get to the point that you think that that goal is there to find a breakthrough in a specific kind of cancer or cancer generally, a breakthrough in Alzheimer's, a breakthrough in kidney care, uh, that, uh, that ARPA-H, as the president envisions it, could very well be the way to get there. And I don't in my own view, I don't see ARPA-H as one big entity located anywhere, but more a group of individuals coming together that are either virtually associated or associated in, in one small office complex, but have, have outside private sector partners or university partners that they're working with on one very targeted project that the government is there with its money, its resources, and the team that's been put together to be a part of reaching a, a goal and have a great sense of what that goal might be. Great. I'm going to change topic for a second because we don't have to be for that much longer. You know, the workforce shortage in healthcare is at a crisis. You know, we have here at Hopkins um, Medicine, we have 45,000 employees and we have 4,000 openings. Is there a role for Congress to try to address the shortage in healthcare workers and what, what role would that be? Well, there, there is a role and I think the role can be pretty varied. For instance, we've had a real problem with healthcare workers in small and rural communities. Uh, and, um, and I was involved in some legislation. We now have several different medical schools working on programs that are much more based in a smaller community uh, as a medical school environment and with the, the sense that uh, if, if you're based there, you may very well decide that this is the kind of community I understand why I'd want to live here. I understand the benefits of the 100,000 community as opposed to the 1 million people community. Um, that's one need, uh, looking for ways that we can make uh, health care providers in specific areas uh, have a easier opportunity uh, to pay for their pay for their education just like we did in the 50s and 60s uh, when we thought we were behind and we were behind the, the Russians in a couple of areas suddenly math science teaching all became much more significant um, I, I think we could do these things and we, we are trying to find ways to do that. It's not the only field where we have significant shortages right now, everything from police officers to truck drivers to heart surgeons uh, appear to be a, 
areas where we don't have enough people to do the work that needs to be done, but clearly healthcare is always is a preeminent part of, of, of what our goals should be there. Somebody told me one time that um, if uh, everybody in your family is well, you've got lots of problems. If one person in your family is sick, you've got one problem. And um, you know the, the healthcare providers of, of our country are people who step forward uh, when people have that one overwhelming problem and try to help solve it. Uh, and we need to be sure, I was president of a university, one time we were moving toward a doctors in physical therapy, which that school now has. We had, uh, uh, had a bachelor's completion program that we turned uh, on nursing. We turned into a full-fledged nursing school while I was there. Uh, but trying to anticipate what those needs are in, in advance. Uh, and again, some of those needs could be in medical engineering and other areas, uh, but I think there's a definite government opportunity there and a government role to play uh, in trying to both anticipate what our healthcare provider needs may be, uh, and then think about how we fit those needs so that we don't wind up with either shortages uh, in, in communities or shortages in specialties that don't allow people to have the kind of health care uh, that they'd like to have and deserve to have. Great. So, Senator, I have a final question, and it, I hope you don't feel uncomfortable, but I'm going to ask it. Um, polarization and partisanship appear to be toxic when viewed outside of Washington. Does it feel the same inside? You know, I think the Senate is particularly uh, inclined to the idea that relationships still matter. Uh, part of that is the rules of the Senate. I'm an advocate for the Senate not just becoming uh, like the House. And so I think the fact that you almost always have to have some Republicans and some Democrats working together to get anything done helps. I, I, let, me, let me say two things, Dean, about this that might be worth saying. Um, one is when the chips were down in our healthcare environment last year, while if you do everything you do now, you do some spending differently and do some other things differently. I think the Congress did step up in a bipartisan way, uh, in an incredibly significant bipartisan way, coming up with you know things like how to keep people on the payrolls they were on and what to do about health care and including the not the not-for-profit sector for the first time in those kinds of those kinds of, of plans. Uh, but the second thing I've also heard so I think we we're, we're we're inclined right now in our politics to just get deeper and deeper into the spot we're already in. Part of that driven by a, a widely diversified media where you can go to one one media source and find out more of what you're inclined to find out and maybe not find out everything you need to know. And um, I, I hope we can figure out how to work away from that. And, and I hope we can get away from that tendency to um, make campaign pledges that are unreasonable in a democracy. Uh, in a democracy, nobody ever gets what they want, or at least you wouldn't get what everything you want very often just like you don't get everything you want very often at a research institution or at, at church or at home. If you're, getting, if you're getting everything you want all the time, there's probably something wrong with you. And democracy is the same way. I, I think constantly talking about what you'd never do in politics is different than talking about what you'd like to do. And uh, sometimes what you think you'd never do is the best alternative at the time. Now, it doesn't mean you can't have inviolate principles on some things that your, your faith, your personal experience, other things lead you to believe this is something I'd never be part of. Uh, but in a reasonable and rational world, you can't have too many things that you uniquely have fenced yourself off from the rest of the world. So... I hope we can begin to find more effective ways to work together. Um, 
uh, my, my staff about three or four years ago, knowing I was working with lots of people in the Senate, uh, came to me one day and said, I didn't ask them to do this. They came to me and said, we just thought it'd be interesting to check and see. At that time, there were 48 Democrats in the Senate and 52 Republicans. How many of the 48 Democrats you'd been the principal sponsor of legislation with, either the lead, lead sponsor and a Democrat was your co-sponsor or vice versa? The answer was 44. And I thought that was a pretty good answer that maybe not a dozen things, but at least there were 44 Democrats that I'd found one thing that we could agree on and move forward and try to get a legislative solution. And I think that's how democracy is supposed to work. Well, Senator, on behalf of everyone here, I'd like to thank you for your 26 years of service to this country and for spending the last hour with us. So thank you so much for being here today. Great to be with you. Thanks for letting me do it this way. I wish I could have been there in person, but uh, I'm certainly glad we can make the day work. Can we give uh, the Senator a big round?